Hello everyone and welcome to day 19 of Bitwise where we code the complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Last time um, on stream I started, well, we, we, we did started doing real work on the Noir library which is sort of the inaugural library for um, written in ION, primarily in ION, with some C binding code uh, backed by uh, the SDL uh, cross-platform media library under the hood. Um, and then on the extra stream, we actually started putting in, yeah, again, on the main stream, we, we did a little bit of stuff, but it was pretty anemic. On the, on the extra stream, we done did quite a bit more. And then uh, after that, on my own time, I've been doing a ton of work on it. So before uh, going into kind of uh, the work for today, I want to do a demo and, um, and talk about what's there so far, which is, it's not super exciting, but um, I think there are some things that are worth talking about in terms of API design decisions and stuff that I touched on in the extra stream. But uh, again, I want to make the mainstream self-contained for people who don't uh, have endless oceans of time to pour into those. So uh, let's jump right in. So um, just to recap, Noir is a, you know, people in the game industry usually call these like platform layers or pra platform abstraction libraries or something like that. And, um, you know, unlike what you, you know, you can think of something like POSIX uh, as being an abstraction of some Unix style platform capabilities. Um, but when game developers talk about platform abstraction, they usually refer to something higher level than that like um, graphics, uh, basic window management, um, audio, uh, all these different things that tend to be quite uh, diversely handled on different operating systems, unlike something like POSIX, which is pretty universal. Um, and so uh, in terms of actually doing the, the really nitty gritty work of, of implementing these abstractions on different platforms, uh, we're using SDL, uh, which is a really a really solid, well-tested library that has a lot of commercial use, and so it has a lot of real-world testing. And so in order to just have sort of turnkey platform, cross-platform support, we're using that. Um, but we're partly uh, partly so we don't have to um, directly expose all of SDL to, to ION, which would require a bunch of work, but also because we may want to do some things differently and simpler or just different, um, we have our own layer on top. Um, and uh, it's it, like I said all in the previous stream, it's based on a, on a previous set of experiments I've done over the last couple of years for, for this sort of thing. Um, so let me just jump in and do the demo with that context out of the way. So um, uh, I, I should mention, by the way, uh, roughly half of it is in ION and half of it is in C. The stuff that's in C, I, I just want to mention this since people were, uh, were bringing it up, like why am I writing this stuff in C? I'm, try I'm trying to only write the stuff that interfaces with SDL specifically in C. Um, sometimes that means that stuff that in theory could be an ION is in C just because it's, it's more convenient to put it next to the SDL code. But for the most part, all the code in C is very, very SDL specific. Um, and so all the generic stuff is in ION and uh, right now the test code is also in ION. So that's the bulk of it. Um, but yeah, let's just run the application. So right now, uh, it brings up a window by default. Actually, let me not move the, move the mouse so that doesn't scroll off the screen. Uh, and I just have some, te some test info printed. So you can see we get the, um, the name of the platform, which, which is Windows for me, and we get display properties for my primary monitor. So 1920, 1080, 60 hertz refresh rate, uh, 120 DPI. And then we get some initial uh, information about, you know, like the you know, the, mouse, the initial window position and size and mouse position, both locally relative to the window origin and, and more globally relative to the uh, global coordinate system. Um, so uh, one thing we did last time is, uh, first off, like uh, you can't see what I'm doing with my hands, but if I use the arrow keys, I have it set up in my demo so that they directly move the, um, move the window by 100, plus minus 100 in, a, in whatever direction. Um, if I hold shift while, while using those keys, I move the mouse cursor uh, in the same increments. And you can see on, uh, you, if you see the messages on printing, as long as I'm inside the window surface, I get, um, I get these mouse move deltas, uh, both the normal mouse move and the global mouse move. But if I move off the, uh, off the surface of the window, you can see I get a clamp movement. So rather than being minus 100 for the, mouse move, it's minus 74 because it's clamping to the window coordinate system, but we still get the global mouse moves out of 
out of the, the window. So that's one thing. If I hold control, I can expand or contract the window in different directions. You'll see that it's not redrawing the contents of the window, which is why we have this sort of stale contents, but that's just because we're not doing anything with the window surface yet. But uh, we're also resizing those in these 100 uh, unit increments. So that's the sort of thing you can do. Um, and you can see here, it's not just printing the delta, it's printing the final size of the window. So it's, it's detecting those changes. Um, other stuff we can do, if I press T, I change the window title. So it says title one now, it's set noir before, which is the default window title. If I press T again, it will just increment a number and generate a new title. If I press uh, A, it will copy the title to the flipboard. So if I now go to some text buffer and I paste it, I get the title. So there's, you know, in other words, there's a flipboard integration, but I can also go in the other direction and say, hello world and uh, control X to cut it. And then if I type B, oh, did I break that? It's possible I broke that because I was screwing around with that yesterday. Um, no, that is there. All right. Um, although it looked like there was some garbage there in interim, so it's possible and there's a bug there I need to fix. But anyway, you can do that sort of bidirectionally, and you can go back to doing this and type A, and now we're back to this, and we can type bitwise and uh, copy it. Yeah, so it seems like the the copy I, I broke something in the copy clipboard to title thing. So anyway, um, other features uh, there's audio. Oh, no, let me show other stuff first. You can do Alt-Enter to toggle full screen, and this is just in the demo. This is not globally. Um, you can actually see the code for that right behind uh, in the text window. Uh, it's just negating a value. I'm not calling a function, so that's something we'll talk about when we go over the API design. But there's basically no functions except for a single update function from, from all, all the current features. It's all based on state synchronization, so I'll talk more about that in a sec. But um, so Alt Enter toggles full screen, and you can see it remembers the previous position of the window before full screen, size and position. Um, there's mouse capture, uh, resizability, where if I hover my cursor over the borders of the window, I can't resize it. Of course, I can still resize it forcibly, like I can do this, stuff like that. But uh, the UI handles for uh, doing it as a user are not there. But if I press, uh, if I press R, it's now enabled and I can resize it. I get all these window resize messages and so on. And I can type R again, and now I, I'm back to being locked. I can't resize the window. Um, let me see what other features. Uh, there's, there's E, which is sort of a debug feature for now. If I type E, I enable printing all events. The way I'm actually, the normal messages we we're seeing before are not strictly event-based in the conventional UI style. So I'm not looking at the event queue for those. But for this uh, debug print where it's printing the, the capital event uh, thing, it actually is uh, using that event queue. So that, that's the only thing that uses the event queue currently in this test app is the debug print. So you can see I'm getting, not only am I getting that, um, that a button was pressed, but it, the exact pixel coordinate where it was pressed um, in the window coordinate system. Um, so let me turn that back off. So you can see it's now back off. So yeah, now it's on, now it's off. Uh, other features, H. This was fun. We finished on this in the extra stream where I turned, <laughs> I did a hide window toggle, but the problem is once you hide it once, um, it you can't, uh, the, the window focus is lost and it won't accept your second H to toggle it back on. So I did this, this was also a fun test of the timing system. Um, I did uh, like a reshow timer so I, I press H and it hides for one second and then it comes back. Um, and the way that's done, you can see right here, um, there's a, like the, the API context struct itself maintains time, both absolute and delta time. Um, and you and it, it has a redundant representation where you can use either the milliseconds or the seconds and floats or the time and ticks, which is sort of an internal, uh, you know, low level counter performance counter, but either way, so you can use what's convenient. In this case, I just chose to do it in milliseconds. So plus 1000 milliseconds from the current time. And then here, if the window is currently hidden and we're past our deadline for showing the window, then we just make it unhidden, right? We said hidden to false. So you can see how simple it is to do something like this. Um, 
that's what the code looks like. You don't have to do some kind of complicated dance. Um, let's see if there's other stuff before I move on to audio. Right. Um, this is kind of a cool, I, we did this on the extra stream as well, but I'll just repeat it here. Um, this is a cool demo of how by having this kind of state-based API rather than a function-based API, you can do, you have a lot of uniform representation that lets you have very kind of elegant code. So in this case, uh, you have these three pieces of state, the window position, the window size, and the mouse global position. These are all things that we, um, you know, so by the way, the code right here is how the, um, what do you call it? The code right here is how this stuff is implemented, like move, move, uh, arrow keys with and without shift and control. The, the, the code you're seeing right here is how that's implemented. So you have these three different kinds of state, right? They're fundamentally different from the OS's point of view. The window position, the window size, and the double map position are not exposed through the same API, right? Those are completely heterogeneous kinds of things as far as the OS is concerned. But in our model of the API, these are all int twos. So they're two-dimensional vectors containing an X and a Y coordinate that are ints. And our API is responsible for synchronizing our model to the OS model using whatever functions it needs to do that. But one really cool consequence is that in this case, dest is a pointer to an int two. So it's a pointer to a two vector of ints. And because even though the underlying APIs are extremely heterogeneous and diverse, uh, our model is homogeneous. And so we can have a single pointer that points to either of these things. And then this code for moving the position works the same for all, all three. So, you know, this is a small scale example of how this kind of state-based model uh, introduces a lot of uniformity and, and, and kind of um, reduces code. Now, this is not a standard example, but it's just, I, th I thought it was kind of a cute trick. And by the way, this wasn't written as a demo of this trick. This was just something I noticed that could be factored out. And this would not have been possible to factor out uh, with a more traditional function model. You could, in theory, have had like, two function pointers for the get and the set part, but then you would need to ensure that the OS's get and set functions for those are totally compatible in terms of the function pointer type and stuff, which is unlikely and, and, and in any way uh, it's less convenient. Like you, you can see, you can even do this minus equals, right? Like which is implicitly doing a read modify write. So it's reading the existing position and adding to it and so on. Uh, if you want to do the equivalent of this, you would have to get the old position, at, at minus, subtract 100 and set the new position and stuff like that. So this is uh, pretty neat, I think. Um, the um, so yeah, so that's kind of the idea. It's a bidirectional state synchronization approach. Um, some of these uh, pieces of state are unidirectional in the sense that they're purely either going from the app to the API or from the API to the app. Um, but many of them are bidirectional. So for example, you know, when we're moving the mouse cursor, on the one hand, we're reading the mouse cursor's position. Um, but we're also setting it. We can set it, right? And same for the size. So a lot of these things are bidirectionally synchronized. Others are not. Others are uh, unidirectional. Um, but that's kind of the idea of the API. And even for things that are unidirectional, like the API is just pushing them to the user. Um, you know, in my mind, rather than having 100 functions, I would much rather have 100 variables um, any any day of the week. And it really starts to you know, when you have the bidirectional synchronization, that's really when the leverage becomes uh, evident. But even for the case where it's just one way, uh, I really prefer this API design style. So this is basically what the struct looks like. There's a top level struct called app. Um, you know, so let me give some examples of, of stuff here. Init obviously starts out as false. Um, and so that's, you know, everything here is zero initialized by default. So it works with the zero, except for this thing, which is a bit of an annoying case because zero for the window position is a valid thing. And if the user wants that, you don't want to override it with some other default. So I use a very large value uh, as the default, but everything else is zero initialized by default. Then when you call the init function, it will actually kind of fill stuff in you haven't filled in yourself. Um, and um, yeah, um, let's see here. So, I mean, like quit is a simple example of bidirectional synchronization. On the one hand, if uh, the OS, if, if, if SDL ultimately uh, generates a quit uh, event, uh, for example, if you, um, if I use uh, Alt F4, or I use, uh, I just click the, the close uh, uh, button here, all of that translates into a quit message, and that is communicated 
to the app through this flag by setting quit to true. And so uh, it doesn't just like bail out, but you know, it will set it to true. Um, but also the app itself can also set this to true. And if it sets it to true, it doesn't really mean that, you know, I guess it's not really bidirectional synchronization, but what it does mean is that the next time you call update, this thing will bail out because this thing basically will bail out in two conditions. Um, well, the main one actually, I think right now it's only one, one way this can return false and that's if quit is true. So if you want to quit out, um, it, it could happen from this returning false, either because the OS through user interaction like Alt F4 or pressing the close, um, close button in, in the window. Uh, it could either be because of that, but it could also be because the, the app itself set it to true. So this is sort of a unified representation. Um, and so that, I mean, that's like the simplest example of this overall philosophy. And uh, like the clipboard is another example. Right now there's a bug, so I'm not gonna uh, go into that too much. I have to think about why that was happening. But like the clipboard will be synchronized to the OS level clipboard, but you can also put stuff in the clipboard and it will be put in the OS level clipboard. Um, the window is one of the interesting examples because it has a bunch of bidirectional synchronized state. So, th so there are these basic flags like resizable, hidden, and full screen. And these again are bidirectional. Um, you can either just read them to see what state of things are, or you can set them and they will be synchronized under the hood. The title, same deal, is bidirectionally synchronized. Position size, bidirectionally synchronized. Uh, these two are not bidirectional. These are just messages from the OS. Like if there's any movement of, you know, if there's any change in the size or in the position, these flags are set. Uh, and then here are these kind of internal things that are basically used to detect changes. So um, someone brought this up on Twitter. And if you're familiar with React, and the whole uh, way it does the virtual DOM diffing and uses that to decide what changes to actually issue to the real DOM. It's kind of the, it has a lot of similarities to, to, to this approach. And so we need to know basically what the thing we synchronize to last is so that if, if the user changes one of these fields, we can see when there's a change and we can call the corresponding OS function in order to enact that change and bring things back in sync. Um, and kind of the same thing across the board. Same with time, same with um, with the mouse stuff. Um, let me demo the audio. Uh, I didn't demo the audio before. So uh, I press P to toggle audio. So it starts paused so you don't get a migraine. Uh, but you can press uh, P to toggle audio. Um, right now, I just have a simple two operator FM synth hooked up so you can if you want to play with it yourself it's um, IJKL like so that triangle of, of arrow like keys is uh, is hooked up if you use them without a shift modifier they uh, left uh, J and L uh, lower and increase the frequency of the carrier uh, I and K increase the volume although very slowly um, and it's uh, in linear space, so it maybe doesn't, it's not perceptually linear, uh, I guess. Um, and if you then hold shift, you're now doing the same, but to the modulator rather than the carrier. So you can play around a little bit. Um, and the way that works is, I mean, it, it's, it's a pretty standard, like under the hood, SDL uses a callback based uh, sort of audio generation sample generation mechanism there's different ways to do that stuff under the hood you can use you know you can use semaphores or something um, but typically it does need to get called asynchronously in some fashion um, you can't do it in a well you can't do it if you want to have low latency it doesn't work reliably to do audio with a push-based approach you sort of have to do it asynchronously in a pull-based approach where when the OS knows that the audio that you've submitted is about to run out, it will ask for another chunk of audio samples. And so uh, the way that's exposed, where were we with the audio? The way that's exposed is there's a callback and the callback gets called with a context pointer, which is just like you know any user data that you want to pass in. And then it's called with a number of frames and a frame represents not a single sample, but a set of samples for the set of channels. So float two right now, I'm hard coding it to be 
uh, which will probably stay this way for the foreseeable future. I'm not interested in making this API, at least for now, super, super general, but it uses float samples, um, which are convenient to produce. And uh, it uses two of them because it's stereo, so there's a left and a right channel. And so uh, you get that pointer to that buffer to fill in. And the way SDL works and we work is that if you don't fill it in, you just get silence. So even if this callback is null, you get silence. Um, if you abruptly make it null, you're going to get a hard like as it turns off, but you're not going to get like random uninitialized data uh, making you deaf from, from the noise if you don't uh, correctly fill in everything. But anyway, yeah, you get this array and you know how many frames to fill in. So if you look at how this is implemented for the demo, I just have a, like I said, a simple FM, FM synthesizer. Um, I have this global state for the, um, for the two oscillators. Um, well, the only state really, well, that's not true. All of these are state because all of them can be modified. But the only thing that's changing at audio rate is the phase. Um, and so based on the, the frequency of the oscillator and the sample rate uh, of, the, of the audio system, which reflects the rate of, uh, at which you're getting called with you know, number of samples or whatever, um, number of frames per second, uh, you calculate per, per, per frame how, how much phase to change. And that's what these deltas are. Um, and then you can see we step these each frame and then for each value, we just do this, you know, there's the inner, uh, sine oscillator and that is fed in as a phase offset to the outer sine oscillator. And that's what's called FM synthesis. And so it, you can, if you tune these, uh, you can get some interesting effects. So in this case, uh, the primary frequency, uh, if we set this to zero, you should get a pure tone. So this is a pure tone at 440. This is a concert concert A note. Uh, if you set this to 10, this is a quite low rate. So it's t t 10 frames, uh, not 10 frames, uh, t 10 hertz, right? T 10 repetitions of the per second. You're basically going to hear a, a wobble, a pretty quick wobble. You can hear the wobble, right? Um, if I increase this, first, I mean, perceptually, first the wobble just kind of increases. But what you'll hear is that at some point you actually start getting a quite different type of spectrum, which is not really wobble, but it's just more of a rich, like something. Let's see here, so you can find something. Anyway, if you if you get certain ratios of the carrier and modulator frequencies, you can get. Um, I mean, that's kind of how you do instrument design with FM synthesizers. Is you, there's certain there's a certain well, some of it is purely mathematical, but you can basically have certain relationships where you get a very kind of like if you have you know if you have your your fairly high frequency carrier and you have a low frequency uh, modulator, then basically what happens is uh, at least in the case of a single sinusoid, basically what happens is the spectrum kind of gets thickened by a band that's roughly plus minus the uh, modulator frequency. But if the modulator frequency gets much higher, you start basically getting kind of wraparound. Uh, and by the way, what I said is not totally true because there are so-called higher intermodulation products than just plus and minus the, the, the modulator frequency. But you get sort of like certain side, side spurs corresponding in spacing to the uh, uh, modulator frequency but if you make the modulator frequency much higher what happens is that you get significant aliasing where the plus and minus frequencies actually wrap around and they start filling in those gaps between those otherwise uh, kind of discrete spacings and you get these very thick spectra which you could use to create different um, different interesting uh, s sort of sound design and so depending on how you set things up, you can either get things that sound vaguely like pitched instruments, but with much richer uh, sort of harmonic spectra, or you can get something that sounds kind of very thick and non-pitched. Anyway, sorry, that was random digression. Uh, we'll talk about audio in the future. We'll be doing a bunch of audio stuff in the future. Um, but you can see like this is basically just the API right now, and this is a simple demo. And if you want to play around with it, I have some other synthesizers in here. So if you, if you use this one, this one is really boring. 
Um, it's basically just an additive sense, so there's just two independent. So this is linear, right? There's no, you don't get the interesting spectra you get from nonlinear uh, intermodulation products. So you just have a low frequency oscillator, but it's just being added to the high frequency oscillator. Um, and so you, you can just hear two independent tones. Um, if you instead do use this, which is ring modulation, you're now back and you have nonlinearity, but the spectrum of ring modulation is much simpler than frequency modulation because this basically, in the frequency domain, this just corresponds to convolution. So this is where you get the plus minus of the frequencies uh, as these discrete spikes in the spectrum. And so um, it's a much purer kind of spectrum, but you can get very distinct beat frequencies as a result. Let's see if we can get something. In order to get beat frequencies, we need to get something much closer to each other. We, so let's start with a higher frequency. Did I do this wrong? If you if you get something like this, shouldn't it? Maybe it's just because they're not similar. Let's make both of these this, and then let's make this gain higher. Sorry, this demo is turning into something else, but... It's just, that still sounds way lower frequency. Um, so if we... If we do this, then it should be plus and minus 440, so there should be a DC and there should be an 880, right? Unless my math is totally wrong. Um, right, so this is a pure tone at 880. Um, but if I detune them slightly, I should get like a 10 hertz. Um, yeah, so you can, I don't know if you can hear it, but there's a slight uh, sort of wobble there um, oh that's why we're hearing the low frequency one yeah that is right so so the interesting thing you'll note is that even though we start with two, two frequencies which are very close to each other actually let's start with things that are perfectly at the same frequency. When you start detuning them, you get actual low frequency aliases. Like, can you hear the rumble? And the rumble is much lower frequency, or much lower amplitude, but you can hear the rumble, which is like, I don't know, 1020 hertz or something. Uh, anyway, sorry, this is major di diversion stuff. Um, Anyway, uh, if, if you want to play around with this stuff in the repository, uh, go right ahead. It's kind of addictive. Uh, this is obviously extremely stupid and simple, but um, even the simple stuff is fun if you've never played with it before. Just make sure I set the values back to something reasonable. Actually, I used to have this. Let me just have manifest types so that if I write things in integer notation, there's no confusion about the type. Anyway, yeah, sorry, I'll stop playing with it now. I could be here for hours. Um, Anyway, so I think that's pretty much the roughly what I wanted to show in the demo. Um, th there, there were some questions, and oh, so let me answer something about this kind of more state-based style versus more event-based style. Um, for uh, for a lot of applications, the event-driven style is great, um, right? Like the event-driven style. What I mean is every frame. And here, here I'm just printing the events, but you can imagine doing things in response to them, right? Um, this event-driven style is fine for a lot of things, absolutely. 
Uh, in particular, if you have if 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 this is wrapping an application that wants to do things in an event-driven way downstream, so you're feeding a down downstream event consumer, the API should offer you this view of the data because otherwise you have to synthesize these events yourself from what we're providing. So this data is always going to be there. So one reason you might want to use this is just because, hey, you like it or you have an existing thing you want to feed events to, and uh, here it's just available as, a, as an event form. Um, the other reason is um, sometimes you're really concerned with a very specific time-ordered view of the data. Uh, in a real-time application, if you're running at 60 hertz, uh, typically that's enough for most things, but there are cases where you care about the specific, like an example is when you click the mouse in a, in a paint application or something, um, you might not want to quantize the you know where you're where you start the paint operation you might not want to quantize that to where the mouse was at the end of the frame uh, you might want to know exactly where it was when it clicked i mean exactly is an exaggeration because there's always going to be somewhere in the signal chain where probably there's some loss of data um, but you get my point like sometimes you want to have a more precise view of that stuff and you can get that with events as well because uh, the event for a uh, mouse button down event is annotated not just with you know here's the button that was pressed but also here's where the the cursor was when it was pressed. So you have the data when you want, when you need it or want it. Um, but a lot of the time, when you're writing this sort of immediate mode code, um, it's much you want to be able to do this. Like you want to be able to say in a given context, is the mouse button down? Was the mouse button pressed? And once we do an immediate mode graphic user interface, you'll see how this stuff is really useful. But even outside of that specific context, I find this style often more useful. But really, it's not ideological. Uh, you have the event-based view if you want it. It's just not uh, forced down your throat either. All right, um, before moving on to today's major code topic, uh, let's just see if people have questions about the stuff I just demoed. Let's see here. Yeah, so Sean is saying it is kind of possible to do push buffer sound. Uh, all right. Yeah, like, so I, I'm, I'm sure you know that I tried doing the push buffer stuff with, with Mu, and I didn't really try to, t t to push it as far as I could to see if it would work. Um, I, I guess since then I've done more audio stuff on my own, and I. Um, I guess I feel less uh, positively inclined towards the push buffer approach based on that. Like I feel like the push buffer approach works really well for low latency sort of command buffer communication with a higher level audio system. Like, you know, you want to say stuff like start playing this clip or stop playing this clip or synchronize uh, this parameter of the clip or something like that. Um, and, and you know, so the push buffer is really great for that, but and I know you can try to make it work pretty well, have drop up protection and all this other stuff, but it just seemed to me that um, it wasn't necessarily worth it. Um, at the same time, I mean, if if yeah, I mean, you can offer a simple API that like even SDL itself actually has a very simple push buffer style queuing API for doing higher latency audio. Um, so there are cases where um, where you can just offer that as a convenience, sort of a turnkey convenience if you just want to play an audio clip and you don't care about latency at all. Um, but it seems that to me that for low latency, uh, once you start worrying about that, you might as well just bite the bullet. Um, and I think later I'll show how to write an audio, simple audio engine with that sort of design, which is you know multi-threaded with uh, a command buffer for an, an, an event buffer going in the other direction, and then things are still callback-based and asynchronous uh, in the audio thread. Anyway. Um, future topic but yeah I, I was i was it was interested to see what you were doing in in your uh, platform library for that but i kind of feel like um uh like i kind of changed my mind on how necessary it was for what i was doing based on experience since i did that first new stream um let's see here Someone's asking, why is sync title a, um, 
let me see here. Uh, why is sync title a buffer? So the reason for this, and, and there may be some bugs in this code right now, but the, the basic logic uh, behind this is that, um, let me see here, sync title. Basically, I make a copy of the buffer internally, and I think the reason I do that, let me just see here. Um, I th oh yeah, I know why. It's because when you get the window title from the OS, you don't have a permanent pointer to it, I believe. It can change, like, you know, there's some problem. E e e if if you're just getting it from the user, then it would be one thing. But I think in the other direction, you need to have a buffer. Now that buffer could be malloced, and and sync title could just be a pointer to that malloc buffer. But I might as well. I thought I would just might as well make it um, make it uh, be a static buffer. Uh, there's no actually no allocations in Noir currently. I don't think there's any allocations except the ones that SDL does under the hood. So all of this stuff is statically allocated, and should be bounce checked. So it's not like buffer overflow prone. Hopefully. Um, someone's asking if I'm doing anything significantly different in ION in this demo for the audio demo. Or could you do the same thing in C? I mean, you can do any. You can, I mean, you can do anything in C. So I don't like we're not using any crazy ION features because ION doesn't really have any crazy features. Like it's mostly C. Like um, the, I mean, the the stuff that I like throughout this code is that. Like, it's nice to not have to specify types everywhere. Like, for example, for this, um, I, I mean, I, I, you know, if I could write, what is it? Uh, mouse button that, right, that, that would work too. But it's nice to have all these type inferred things. Like, I've noticed that just helps a lot. Like, all these intermediate structs, the code gets a lot shorter and, and more uh, readable because there's not all this uh, type info gunking it up. Because really, in a case like this, I'm not assigning it to a temporary variable because it's some really important thing. It's just a shorthand, right? It's almost like a macro as far as I'm concerned in this case. So having type inference, just like s small cases like this, not having to write breaks everywhere. Um, f for me, all that uh, quality of life stuff actually adds up. But right now, I mean, it's... The language itself is not, unlike the stuff we'll be adding today, which is kind of a, a true thing that goes beyond C, just dynamic type info, uh, the language itself doesn't have a ton of stuff. I mean, it has out-of-order declarations and all that uh, nonsense, but that's not really something you'll see on a line-by-line -line basis. Um, anyway, yeah, so I think let's move on. Um, let's move on to, the, to today's topic, which is a compiler topic. Um, and I, I had had this on the list for this week, um, but then I started, <laughs> when I was doing some of this debug printing for these structs yesterday, I realized, hey, this is the kind of thing where having dynamic type info would be kind of neat. Um, and so I thought, let's uh, move it to today. Let's uh, do dynamic type info today. All right. Um, so dynamic type info. Um, this is something that, that, despite Ion trying not to go very far beyond C in most areas, uh, this is something I was planning on doing from the beginning. And I think partly this is because if you're a game developer, you often find yourself needing to do various kinds of manual type reflection in order to have sort of in-game variable um, tweakers and stuff like that. Uh, and maybe for other kind of systems that want to, um, you know, things that could in theory be done with sort of static um, metaprogramming techniques or static code generation techniques, but which are often more convenient to do with dynamic run, uh, runtime info. And you can you can set those up yourself. You can manually define schemas that mirror all the C data types, um, but it's a pain in the butt. It's kind of labor intensive, and it's also potentially error prone unless you have a bunch of asserts that ensure that all the fields are at the right offsets and stuff like that, which you absolutely should have if you do this stuff in C. Um, so anyway, um, what I was planning on doing for ION is a two-tiered approach. So the first tier is just unique type identifiers, um, uh, unique type identifiers with size of. And uh, the idea here is um, kind of like size of, right? Like you can call this um, with a type or an expression, and it will give you back a uh, a type ID. Um, 
which is basically just an opaque integer type. So the thing you get from type of is not a like a full data structure that will give you information around you know all the fields of a struct or whatever. It's really just an ID. Um, but the nice thing about this is you can do this quite cheaply without significant overhead. Um, like you don't have to bake in for a large program. You don't have to bake in huge, you know, huge data structure definitions that may uh, may not be um, uh, that that may not be kind of realistic or uh, appropriate for small programs, for example, that don't really need need to care about the full the full type info. So so uh, feature one, uh, which is the base feature, is really just type by, unique type IDs. Um, and the main thing that they really serve is that you can do stuff like this. Um, you know, you can do stuff like this. Um, you, you can compare them, basically. They're, they're opaque, but you can compare them. Um, and we're probably just going to implement them as actual integers. So in theory, you could add them and do other stuff for now. But uh, conceptually, they're just uh, opaque things that you can compare for. Uh, you can compare in this way. So if you have two type IDs from, from two different things that, uh, that originated at some point in the program, presumably from a statically known type, uh, but then they can be propagated dynamically and at some endpoint they can be compared for equality. And so for example, um, you can imagine doing something like this. Uh, you have um, some type called maybe any, and uh, which is the conventional name for this sort of thing. And then you have a void star and you have a uh, a type ID. Um, and then you could do something like um, like this, and uh, maybe you could do a switch. We'll talk about that in a second. Depending on whether type of is constant, you could do stuff like this, um, and um, um, let's see, and that would be int const. And then any putter. Uh, any putter, something like this. Um, and so really what's being used here, and I'll talk about there's some there, there's some potential issues with making these constant expressions. So maybe you'll have to do this with else if rather than switch. Uh, but either way, um, for now let's just assume they're constants. Um, you know the idea here is that at compile time or when when we generate the code, um, we know what whatever ID int is supposed to be and float is supposed to be and so on. And so these are essentially just constant labels from that point of view or at least known labels. Um, and then the type here was, you know, again, like you can imagine, it originated at some at some point in time. It was probably statically known, right? So probably it was something like this, where, um, you know, you 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 do like uh, int 42, and then you can do, um, you know, type of i, something like that. <clears throat> and so at this point i is known to be an int and so this here is a statically known thing but it gets packed in a dynamic piece of data that is then shipped over here it's just sort of one level of indirection right it calls one function but this could also be stored in a struct and passed around and eventually consumed by a function like this um, and again all we really care about here is identity at this level because we care about whether two things are the same or not we, we also kind of care about them being dispatchable with a switch statement in this specific case, but if you're doing this instead with, you know, if else, um, then I mean it wouldn't change substantially. It would it would be something like this instead, right? Uh, or equal to rather, not, not equal to. But but that that's the basic idea behind type of. So this by itself is actually pretty powerful. You can do a lot just with this in terms of, for example, doing type safe printing like this, um, uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, all right, so that's the, that's the basic feature, and it's necessary for feature two. Um, and we'll start on these in order, um, but um, let me talk about the other one as well because that's really sort of the full, the fully fledged runtime type reflection, um, uh, runtime type info. Um, and the idea here is simply that, um, given a type ID from one of these type, ultimately from one of these type of operations, you can um, 
you can call get type info um, on any type. Um, and this returns um, this returns a pointer to type info. And so this can be null if you call this function and you've compiled either the the whole program or the specific type in question. If it's been come, if you've not emitted type uh, dynamic type info for that, this function can return null. So this is how we provide some level of uh, abstraction of whether the thing you're dealing with uh, was compiled with or without full type info. Um, and so you need to be robust in the face of that unless you very tightly control every type that can feed into this code path uh, for your specific code. But then once you have this, your type info, I think I actually wrote up a schema earlier, right? So I wrote this uh, before the stream. I actually already have it in the code. Uh, so I did a little bit of advanced prep for this. I mean, there's nothing interesting here, but um, and I think I don't want the ion prefix. Um, well, okay, let's just leave it for now. But anyway, uh, the type info would be something like this thing here, which is more or less what we already have in our compiler. Like if you look at the type, um, there's a lot of things called type currently. Um, if you look at this struct here, it has some additional stuff that's not really pertinent because it's sort of only useful for the compiler or at least not super relevant to anyone else. Um, and so at least for now, I'm not trying to share this stuff. Uh, there's no easy way to share it anyway because one is an ion and the other is in C right now. But it's basically the subset of this data that's pertinent to application programmers. So there's first off the kind. And you know again, we're not going to have things like this, which are just for internal use, but there's versions of all of these here basically um, and then data like the size alignment uh, the base type if it's a pointer or an array or something like that um, and then to, you know if it's an array type then there's the number of elements if it's an aggregate then there's the fields each field has a name a type and an offset and so on functions have blah 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 right like they have all this stuff um, so so that's basically what the type info is it's this kind of tagged union um, which you get a pointer to one of these, and then you can kind of navigate the hierarchy. Um, and I should mention that the way this works is that the base type pointer would actually not be a pointer, I think. I think it would be a type ID. So um, uh, all the internal, if you will, all the internal references are not actually uh, type info pointers, but they would be type IDs. Uh, I think I didn't do it correctly in this design here, just before I thought about it more. Um, but basically, all of this stuff would be like type ID. Um, and so um, if you want to navigate a struct, you start with a type ID, you get a type, and at every level, you have to call to get type info on type IDs in order to sort of go down the pointer chain. Because at any given level, the data you're dealing with may not have type info. Like You have to deal with that possibility. Otherwise, you force uh, a monstrous amount of type information in just for the sake of having some type information. Um, and so that's that's the basic idea behind this design. Um, all right. Um, so uh, let's not get too into that for now, but I just wanted to sort of put that into context, um, that that's kind of step two. And, and I know how to do this too. This shouldn't be too bad. But step one is really the foundation, and it's by far the most useful of the two because it's kind of more universally deployable, whereas this is kind of bloated, but very convenient when you need it. Um, so let's do feature one first. So let's start with adding parsing for type info, um, or lexing even. So um, let's just follow, let's just search for size of, since that's already present. Um, that should be it as far as the keyword goes. Um, and then um, there should be a yeah, size of keyword here. Um, we're just going to match the basic structure because it's actually going to be the same syntax. Because in both it, with both size of and, and type of, you can have either an expression or you can have a, a name type, right? So you actually want uh, the same thing here. Um,
I'm also just going to move away from ION for a sec so we can go back to test one, which is where I do all my sort of uh, compiler development testbed stuff. Um, so let me just unload this so it doesn't get in the way. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so um, we should be able to uh, trigger an assert when we're not handling the new AST node, but um, let's let's trigger the assert. So so let's make a function called uh, test type of, and for now it will uh, it will fail. Um, and so um, you can do type type of um, you can do type of i. So it's an expression. Uh, and, and you know it could even be um, just to make it even. It could be like i plus i plus one, right? So it's a, not just an identifier, but it's an expression. Um, you can also do this, um, and you can also use you know something like like this if you want to have a full type spec. Um, yeah, so that was an assert because we're not handling a certain case. Um, let me show you, actually, so that's a good reason to get rid of this. It's an annoying thing in Visual Studio. I have to figure out how to deal with, but um, let me just run this. Okay, so we have an assert, and it's because we're not handling that case in the expression resolver. So let's just go right in. Um, Um, for, for now, let me just put them in like this, and uh, just so each case is there, but still have them assert. And that should still assert, but now it should it should hit these cases instead of hitting the generic default, right? Um, so uh, what I'm going to do. So first off, uh, note that implicit in what I was saying before is the idea that each of these type IDs is a unique identifier. So it's not okay for two different ints or type ofs of things that are supposed to be int or some other type, including compound types uh, like pointers and cons and whatever. It's not valid for those to compare unequal when they're really equal. And of course, they also can't be conflated. Like the type of cons, uh, type of int can, can't be the same as type of char or type of float. Um, but you'll note that we already have this, and I realized this when I was thinking about the implementation. We already have this in our type interning. Like we already have unique representations of types, right? We have all this cache type nonsense, uh, which is just like string interning, but for types. And so I realized that we can actually do type IDs very, very easily, uh, at least as long as we're doing whole program compilation and as long as we're not doing DLLs that have to sync their type info. And for now, I'll just assume that's the case. Um, and so basically um, what I'll do is I'll have, um, Oh yeah, that's also a C++ identifier, but I don't care about that. Um, okay, so we can, we'll jam it in here, and we won't use zero because the zero is reserved for meaning you know nothing uh, or something like that. Um, and so we're going to have. Um, going to have this and it's going to start well maybe it shouldn't start at this actually um, so first off we have these hard-coded things and these are always going to get hard-coded identifiers um, because they're sort of initialized manually rather than through the constructor function and they're kind of the the base type of the whole system um, and so we're going to have explicit type IDs for these and I'm just going to um, Oh, well, I definitely shouldn't. Uh, 
Um, just going to number them sequentially. For now at least, maybe we'll have something more automated, but um, the rest of it will be automated. This is just sort of to seed the system with the basic values. Um, well, I guess we can leave this. I don't know why there's a line break there. You know what, I could just use the type kind directly. Um, now let's use these separate numbers so they're densely packed. We can revisit later. Um, actually, let me let me name these fields since there's already kind of two different integers and it's not entirely uh, obvious what they are. I feel this, normally I would say that mixing uh, undesignated and designated initializers is not a great idea, but one case where I find that it actually is, is better is for this kind of tagged union where the, the head field is always the tag and then you name the rest of the fields um, explicitly. I think that works pretty well. Well, actually, let me, rather than at least copy and paste, it's a little bit too much manual typing. Um, even for me. Um, so next type ID, and let's say that's 16. So it's, it's one past, um, it's one past the, the manually initialized one. Um, all right, and then what we do is uh, every time we create a new type here, we're going to, I guess we should put that maybe after. Actually, let's move all this stuff around. We put that there so that those two things are next to each other. And then you say type ID is equal to next type ID plus plus. So, um, the one thing about this is this guarantees that any type that is sort of part of the universe of the compiler, which is something that was either kind of hard, like that was either hard to find by the compiler like manually, or something that it saw directly or indirectly in the user program, all of those things are going to go through this code and they're going to get allocated a sequential ID accordingly. Um, and so this is just a neat way of getting uh, interning, uh, sort of piggybacking on the interning for the type IDs. Um, and it also works with the resolver, right? Because when this, well, not even, right? Yeah, it works for that. Because as soon as a type is allocated, we have a type ID, even if it isn't filled in, uh, which is which is what you want. Um, and now, um, let's see here. Go back to the, go, go back to type of stuff. Um, For this, we don't even need to, to complete it, actually. Um, let's make it a UNT. We don't even need to complete it. Um, uh, type, type ID, something like that. And um, this thing has, you know, it has like a little more branchiness to it um, because 
there's this shorthand where you can refer to a type as long as it's a simple type name. Um, and so, it's wrong. Um, and we don't have to complete it. Okay, unresolved name on line 443. That's interesting. So this branch here is when you, I think I did a typo in the AST constructor. No? Oh yeah, I did. Because that should never hit for that line. Okay, so now there's another case we didn't cover, presumably. Oh. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay, so that's the generator because we're not generating it correctly. And that's fine. Um, this is, by the way, why I do these assert zeros. It's not just as a bug, you know, it's not, it's not just to catch bugs, although it helps with that too. It's so that when I'm implementing a new case, since I don't have a language with algebraic data types and exhaustive pattern matching, uh, having this in is like, you know, when I'm adding a new case, I don't necessarily have to think about everywhere I need to add it. I just wait for things to trigger based on a test case. It's uh, uh, a, good, a good habit in any case, but it definitely helps with that specifically. Um, so type of, type of, um, so here we definitely can't do something like this because we need to um, we need to get the resolve type. By the way, this get resolve type thing is new um, because I used to jam uh, type resolve types into the AST, but that made me feel nauseous. So I moved it to a hash table because I'm, once we want to add more communication between the resolver and the back end. You know, to keep cramming crap into the AST is really disgusting, even if it's more efficient in some cases. So I moved it into an externalized hash table, um, and this hash table can 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 accommodate more than just types eventually. And it added it slowed things down by five percent total, but uh, in anticipation of stuff and just for cleanliness, I, I don't feel bad about that. Um, so yeah, um, so we get the resolve type of that expression. And um, and then really we just need to um, just need to print it. And I'm just going to for now I'm just going to use hard coded numbers. Later we may want to have an enum on the C side, right, to kind of mirror the struct and have them have nice names and stuff or whatever. Uh, so you can maybe see them in the debugger with some reasonable thing. You could actually see it there. But uh, for now, let's just emit the thing directly. And so uh, I'm going to assert that the type ID is non-zero. So this is, you know, it's a default initialized to zero. And so if it doesn't get set, uh, we know something is wrong. Um, and uh, just emit it. I think that's it. Um, and let's see here. Yeah, I mean, that's the same idea. 
but even simpler. Well, actually, let's assign it so we can do the assert correctly. Oh, I just realized this is another nice benefit of the hash table approach. Um, by using a hash table, I don't have to add the same resolved, you know, like the type field that something resolves to. I don't have to add it separately for both expressions and for type specs because this is just a void star hash table and, they, and the different types have distinct pointer identity. And so uh, you can use the same map for different types of, of entities that you need to resolve to types. Um, and so that's, I, I thought it was kind of a nice simplification. It removes some duplication in the data definitions. Um, okay, I forgot to close the race. Okay, so that is, that is not, okay, so what is the type, type of expression here? Um, so this is a name. Oh, right, 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 right. Um, because the expression is going to be like int, but that should still have a type, it's just the wrong one. Let me think about that. Um, no, so the type of expression is the argument, but that could be one of two, oh yeah, it can be an int or it can be something else. Um, Let me think about the best way to communicate. Um, so, so basically, the problem is that um, I'm calling type of expression on um, on this thing here, but sometimes it actually doesn't denote an expression; it denotes just a name that has a that, you know that's associated with a type. Um, so I think what I want to do is um, actually associate that with the sim type. And again, yep, I can just jam that in there. Um, and so let's look at the generated C code. Um, so these are all eight. I mean, I'm going to make a more self-contained test case, but um, let's go and look at what they're supposed to be. Right, so this is eight. So that looks reasonable. Um, and you can see this is 37, and that's just because there's a bunch of other types that have been interned at the point where you um, where this type, e, type, D, type ID is assigned. Um, but that should already be enough that we can do some of these things we were advertising in the intro. So let me now do um, this thing. Um, I guess I should have a type ID, uh, type def, Maybe it will be lowercase to sort of indicate that it's a, um, a systems level kind of thing. Um, and then uh, print any.
Oh, right. I didn't set, set my auto build step up. Again. Invalid type in compound literal initializer. I should probably, oh, right, I have to, uh, I should probably say what the types are at some point, but. Okay, so it says this is not a known identifier. Oh, was that from the C code? Well, let's use a different name actually, just so there's no potential if the MSVC gets confused about that. Um, yeah, actually, screw it. Um, type def uint type id. Um, okay. This is the moment of truth, everyone. Okay, let's actually set the startup project. Uh, that's pretty cool. I was going to say something self-serving, like I'm so good, but uh, I mean, this was a little too easy, honestly. Um, but unfortunately, there are assumptions with this overall approach, like I mentioned earlier, about um, um, whole program compilation and no dynamic libraries with but or something like that but i'll keep it like this for now but uh, i thought this was okay that, that was easier than i expected honestly and um maybe i will do q a now or unless i think of some other cool demos to do for this right now uh, before we go to the extra stream and do the the runtime type info on top of it but uh this was pretty easy uh, So yeah, uh, let's see what people were saying or if they have any questions about this stuff. By the way, just to give you an idea of what's involved in doing the next step, basically my plan is to have a array, although it could be any kind of data structure like a hash table if you wanted it to be sparser, um, but to have an array of uh, of pointers to um, of pointers to type info structs, and so that's going to be statically initialized. Basically, that's the idea. And so it will basically be a big array that's like type info table. Um, you know, and you can imagine it will be like uh, you know type of int or a, like designated initializer type of int equals and then it's a pointer so you want to have this and uh and then you have you know kind is like oh you know this is a uh, uh, this is an int and you know it had all the type info from the compiler basically but that's kind of the idea and so if we have this table uh, you can now write a function that basically does a bounds check and then also if it's within bounds it indexes into it and just returns the pointer which you know is default null if it's uh if it's either outside of the range or if it's inside the range, but the entry is unfilled. And again, if it's very sparse, you can use a hash table, but for now we're just gonna use an array. And then all this data is just going to be uh, populated by what the compiler already has in, it, in its type data structures. So that's the next step and I'll do that in, uh, in the extra stream.
Uh, someone's asking, uh, would type info exist for any ion visible type, or would there be situations where even ion declared types would not have type info? Um, the the case where you wouldn't have type info would be maybe for incomplete types. I mean, you could have it. You could say this is an you could you could have type info that basically says this is an incomplete type. Um, but I think for incomplete types, it would probably make more sense to just not have type info. So anytime you are you have, for example, a foreign type that you're just dealing with a pointer, if you have a pointer to some foreign type that you're dealing with incompletely, it's just an opaque thing that you're not really dereferencing or using the size of in any way, um, maybe for some of those foreign types that are from C, you would have no type info. So they would still exist as a type ID, but you wouldn't be able to get type info for them because they're opaque. So that would maybe be an example. Oh, let me... Uh, let me go back and see Sean's comment. Oh, Sean is saying if we get rid of the type ID, we could just have pointers and the pointers could just be sort of dummy values um, that don't, well, Yeah, so I think, I mean, so what, what Sean is talking about is was actually my original plan, but it seemed like it had some issues um, in the case where you're not generating type I, t type info because you want to support type of even in the absence of runtime type info. And you could still do that, but you would have to make sure that the type of pointer values, I guess, you know, it depends on whether you let them alias other pointer types. If you If you let the type, pointers alias other pointer types it wouldn't be hard to generate unique ids uh, even in the case where you're not generating type info but i think the problem is you would like how would you know uh, sean with your scheme how would you know whether you have type info for a given type in the case where you don't do you know what i mean because here we're here we're kind of relying on the fact that if there's no type info then essentially get you know the table is empty or maybe the function get type info is entirely just a null function that just does this right how would you in your scheme how would you um how would you handle the case where you're not generating it yeah so 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 Sean's saying you know if we pack them together we can in the case where they're kind of empty we could get unique pointer values and still have it kind of work out. I, I think for now I'll do the get type info approach, but I'll, I'll think more about what you're proposing. It, it, it makes me feel weird that there is any runtime overhead at all if you have type info disabled, because you can easily have thousands and thousands and thousands of types, because keep in mind, every pointer to something generates another copy. So you typically have at least a factor of two sort of amplification rate on the number of, of type IDs. So I don't know, maybe you're right, but um, my, my hunch was just that it would be cleaner to do it this way. But I, I, I do realize that you have to call more functions and stuff, which may be inconvenient, but uh, I'll think about it. Um, yeah, so like Sean is saying, uh, yeah, this is fair, especially for something targeting embedded. That's kind of my feeling. I don't want to have any forced runtime overhead uh, as a language thing. Um, but if you want to, like, basically, I would like to be able to use size of uh, without worrying about, oh, like, you know, like in, in C++, there's this whole question of RTTI, like, which is this big switch you flip and it bloats your executables and, and whatnot. Um, I want type of to basically be zero overhead. Um, if you want to support DLL linking, you can't make it zero overhead. There has to be some one-time representation to allow unification of type IDs across module boundaries. Um, but I think as long as I make type of not a constant, I could at least punt on that and do it later and only do it maybe if you're building a library that has that is intended to be used in a DLL context. But at least outside of that context, um, I want to have a zero overhead approach when you're just when, when, when all you need are unique IDs. Um, but I will think more about it. But for now, I think this is OK. All right. Um, I think I will. Um, 
I will uh, cut the stream over to the extra stream now, and I will get uh, you know I'll get a drink, and then we'll get started with the the second half of this type info saga. So uh, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for coming by, and see everyone on the mainstream next time. If you're here for the extra stream, stay tuned.